Uh, first of all, I have to uh, thank uh, organizing committee and uh, Alexander and Liliana uh, for kind invitation and uh, and. Uh, and uh, I have to con congratulate on a successful Congress. Now it uh, has passed uh, more than uh, half a day and it's really a successful Congress. Well, uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, does treatment of laryngopharyngeal reflux improve symptoms of chronic rhinosinusitis? I have nothing to disclose and let's start with definition. So, uh, laryngopharyngeal reflux is defined as the reflux of gastric content into larynx and pharynx. And we can extend this into nose, paranasal sinuses, and middle ear. And actually it means in ENT region. And also it's very important to differentiate these two diseases. Uh, laryngopharyngeal reflux or extraesophageal reflux and gastroesophageal reflux disease. In LPR, problem is upper sphincter, esophageal sphincter, and in uh, GERD problem is lower esophageal sphincter. And also there are many characteristics uh, different for these two diseases. So LPR is uh, silent and uh, patients are not aware of this disease, and GERD is evident. Uh, episodes of LPR uh, occur during the daytime in upright position mm -hmm. and of uh, GERD in, during the nighttime in uh, supine position. pH is higher in LPR and there is no esophagitis in LPR but there is esophagitis in GERD. And even one episode of L LPR means pathology. And you can have 50 episodes of uh, gastroesophageal reflux and it could be physiological. And actually, uh, in esophagus is normal mucosa and motility in LPR, and in uh, GERD there is dysmotility, and LPR patients belong to otolaryngologists, and GERD patients belong to gastroenterologists. And to be honest, uh, I have to say that in infants, in small children, LPR could be uh, physiological. And you can see that uh, about 50% uh, of children in age of four months uh, have LPR. So LPR is very important because of comorbidity and uh, it's lucrative comorbidity. And you can see uh, neoplasms, asthma, otitis, and, and so on, but I'm going to be focused on rhinosinusitis. And it was recognized uh, many years ago uh, that uh, actually LPR uh, plays a role in respiratory diseases. But also we should bear in mind that uh, we have similar symptoms in two, these two uh, diseases. So if you look at uh, five major symptoms in LPR and in CRS, uh, two of them are the same. So cough and secretion, mostly post-nasal drip. And also we should bear in mind that sometimes uh, LPR mimics CRS and we misdiagnose CRS but it does not exist really. And I'm going to show you some studies that I was involved with. So one study is uh, in children uh, suspected uh, for LPR symptoms and I examined uh, also endoscopically, and they, then I sent them to a uh, gastroenterologist, pediatrician to uh, make 24-hour uh, pH probe monitoring, and it showed that uh, I am a very sensitive man. So sensitivity was 92%, but uh, I'm not a specific man. Specificity was only 10%. So there are a lot of uh, false positive patients when you look at uh, clinical findings, but there is a, a small number of false negative patients. And uh, after this study, uh, we created some PLPR uh, diagnostic probability score, uh, which could be proper for primary medical care for pediatricians uh, at primary level and uh, uh, GP, GPRs. 
So we uh, look at symptoms, look at uh, local finding, and look at comorbidity. And if uh, present at least one of symptoms, for instance, chronic uh, coughing, then we give one point. If present at least one uh, local sign, for instance, elongated uvula, we give one point. And if uh, exists at least one comorbidity, start from obesity to CRS, we give another one point, and altogether we have a probability score. Low PLPR risk is zero to one point, moderate PLPR risk is two point, and uh, high PLPR risk three points. And according to this uh, probability score tool, uh, we suggest that uh, children with low risk start a change lifestyle and diet, uh, that uh, children with moderate risk uh, start to change lifestyle and diet and to take alginates at least for a month. And uh, high risk uh, LPR, uh, it's, it should be treated with uh, proton pump inhibitors. But it should be evaluated, sure. And uh, I'm going to show you some uh, studies. One is Association of Gastroesophageal Reflux and Chronic Rhinosinusitis Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis. They search Embase and Medline. Uh, they were searching for any study with original data on experimental diagnostic treatment or prognostic association with these two diseases. And uh, they uh, found 32 studies. And in conclusion, they said the result supports a significant association of uh, GERD and CRS. Uh, another study, a uh, very interesting study, Chinese study, uh, subjects were followed for more than two years and uh, in total it was uh, showed that uh, patients with GERD, but many of them actually had uh, LPR, uh, have 2.4 greater risk of CRS than uh, patients with no reflux. Another Italian study, uh, 2,000 patients uh, and uh, patients with gastritis and uh, reflux and rhinitis and rhinosinusitis. And it was uh, show, shown that the, in comparison with controls where they have uh, 40, about 14% 14 uh, GERD, in, it increased to 21% in uh, subjects with rhinitis, almost 24% in subjects with sinusitis, and more than 30% in subjects with rhinosinusitis. Uh, this is very interesting. Helicobacter could be, in a way, uh, some uh, proof of reflux, but not in all patients. And this study, with a small number of subjects, showed that Helicobacter pylori was similarly encountered in healthy and diseased uh, sinus mucosa. But we did also one research, and it is, it is part of uh, Professor Jelavich, who will be lecturer tomorrow, of uh, his PhD thesis, and actually we recruited uh, 50 patients, uh, 40 with CRS with nasal polyps, uh, and 10 healthy control. These CRS patients uh, underwent uh, endoscopic sinus surgery, and we found in 70% of these patients a positive helicobacter pylori. And uh, controls, 100% uh, all were negative. So here you can see very nicely this brown stained uh, immunoreactive structures on the surface of polyp which uh, represent uh, helicobacter pylori. And uh, another study in children, uh, 28 children with CRS, it was uh, shown uh, that uh, more than 60% had LPR and about 80% uh, had improvement uh, after PPI treatment. Another study, outcome of reflux therapy on uh, pediatric chronic sinusitis, uh, they recruited uh, 28 patients with CRS and LPR, planned for a functional endoscopic sinus surgery, and after the treatment, uh, almost 90% of patients avoided surgery. Then one uh, systematic review, uh, they passed through, they, they searched uh, PubMed and Cochrane database, and in a 65-year uh, period, and they found uh, 12 uh, studies which uh, met criteria, and four aimed to effect of PPIs. And you can see, on the right side of uh, uh, the slide, that in all of these four 
studies. One was controlled randomized study, uh, was improvement of sinonasal symptoms after PPI uh, treatment, uh, mild improvement, uh, significant improvement, but in all of four studies, uh, there was improvement. And also I'm going to show another uh, study uh, where I was involved. It's uh, eight weeks of omeprazole, 20 milligrams, uh, significantly reduces both laryngopharyngeal reflux and comorbid chronic rhinosinusitis signs and symptoms. And it's a uh, randomized uh, double-blind placebo-controlled uh, uh, trial. And we recruited uh, 60 patients with uh, CRS and LPR approved by PH 24-hour uh, probe monitoring. And the 30 of them were treated with omeprazole, 20 milligrams per day, eight weeks, and 30 with placebo. And actually, we got that CRS scores were significantly better in study group than in control group, and nasal endoscopy score was very significantly better in study group. And I think it's the last. Uh, article I'm going to show you, uh, treatment of laryngopharyngeal reflux may decrease subjective symptoms of nasal congestion and objective measures of nasal resistance. And uh, actually, uh, this is article published in uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association, and uh, it's based on one Turkish uh, study. Uh, they recruited 100 uh, subjects, uh, 50 subjects uh, had approved uh, LPR, but with no CRS or with no allergic rhinitis. And uh, they ha had 50 controls, and uh, they use uh, nasal obstruction symptom uh, evaluation tool and uh, rhino manometry to measure total nasal resistance. And uh, after 12 weeks of PPI treatment, uh, there was the same, the same uh, situation, the same scores in uh, LPR group and uh, control group. And I come to conclusion. So uh, LPR should be evaluated in CRS patients. No doubt about it. Then LPR should be treated in CRS patients. It could improve CRS symptoms. Some patients could obviate planned surgery after this kind of treatment it could improve surgical outcome. But to be honest, it's still controversial. Thank you. Okay, can I ask one question? So I've got quite a lot of patients who come with a primary complaint of a nasal blockage and they've been diagnosed with a rhinitis. They take a medication for that, which is not helpful. They often have the surgery. But when I really ask them about the nasal congestion, that I will learn that it's not really that physically they can't breathe through the nose. They will only describe something like a sensation of a blockage in the back of the nose. And then it continues. Then I would ask them, when is the problem? They will define it during the night time, morning time. And so it will slowly lead, of course, to the laryngeal, uh, laryngopharyngeal reflux diagnosis. It would be really great because we give every patient that's not 22 questionnaires to uh, somehow differentiate this pattern or basically to be able to, to diagnose it also with some questionnaire um, that we routinely give to patients for CRS or for rhinitis, but also to evaluate this pattern which would lead us directly to the laryngopharyngeal reflux because I think there are many patients who are misdiagnosed because they, because they say that I've got congestion, which is a very broad term. Uh, well. The most important in LPR is empiric treatment, which is kind of coming to diagnosis. So we can start with empiric treatment. Yeah, but, I, but I scope every pa So I used to scope every patient, into, including the postnasal space, and I will scope every patient, including uh, pharynx and larynx, mm. every single person. And, and it really seems to be quite uh, effective because I've, I am able to identify many laryngopharyngeal reflexes this way. Tom Sloth. Yeah, a quick comment. V very nice talk, uh, very nice research. Um, I think it's 
we need to be careful to, in, in the end, with the PPI treatment, it does improve nasal symptoms, but it's not actually treating the nose, it's treating the nasal effects of the reflux. So we know that reflux can affect mucociliary clearance, it uh, makes saccharine clearance much longer. Um, so by reducing the influence of the reflux on the nasal cavity, you improve nasal resistance and nasal mucociliary clearance, but it's not actually treating rhinitis or chronic sinusitis. That's true, but final result is uh, good. Exactly. Yeah. I have one more question. Um, so you gave an excellent summary of the data, um, and your, in your conclusions you stated that um, LPR should be evaluated and treated in CRS patients. Um, I'm wondering if you could specify if there's a, a more specific group of CRS patients that you are evaluating and treating reflux in, or is it everyone that you're seeing? So the question is, as I understood, uh, do we have to uh, diagnose LPR in CRS patients or not? No. Is there a, is there a specific, are there specific characteristics of CRS patients that, that you look for in order to then go on and evaluate for reflux, such as a refractory patient, someone who, you know, does not improve with standard surgery or medical therapy, or are you, are you actually treating for reflux in essentially all CRS patients? Well, I think that uh, there is one uh, niche of patients uh, who uh, mostly uh, have refractory CRS, and uh, they are mostly suspected to have LPR. And uh, actually, the relationship of LPR and CRS is mostly in refractory CRS, and uh, this comorbidity, it seems, uh, plays some role to uh, put us in situation not to, to, to be uh, effective in treatment of this kind of patient. So we should bear in mind this LPR and uh, sometimes try to uh, treat, uh, give empiric treatment. Yeah, so I think that's a good point as we, as we sort of under, as we better understand the etiology and, and endotypes of, of CRS that we're looking at. Uh, specific subset of patients, the more refractory ones, where that that may have these other characteristics that you mentioned, um, that may be the the patients that tend to have reflux a bit more. But I, I, I would like to just to add a comment, as I work at the same institution with Tomsla for years. I mean, we don't give PPIs even to refractory sinusitis patients if we don't have signs of reflux in these patients on endoscopy or a pharyngoscopy, and if he has no symptoms. And which um, go in the direction. PH yeah. probe, yeah. yeah. Or impedanza, or multi-channel intraluminal uh, impedanza. So it's not uh, my, uh, let's say, a suggestion, give everybody who uh, has CRS uh, PPIs. No, it's not. But bear in mind that it could be uh, present in this kind of patient, and uh, if you don't know what to do, and if you uh, tried with everything, uh, try to focus in uh, LPR and try to treat this uh, disease.